you are. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thanks as well to those who are joining us online and a special welcome to what I'm guessing is some members of the extended CLAP family. Um, so I do have a couple of announcements. Today, this afternoon, I'll be uh, leaving town on a vacation. And so for the next two weeks, if uh, you have a pastoral emergency, please get a hold of Terry. You can also call the church office and they can, uh, they can make contact with him. And next Sunday, Dominic will be leading the service, and I'm grateful to both of them for, for making it possible for me to go away. And I'll be back here in two weeks and look forward to seeing you, seeing you then. Uh, second thing we, um, oh, connected to that, our Friday events, you know, we have normally Bible study and a healing Eucharist and um, contemplative prayer. We will not have our Friday events for the next two weeks um, while I'm gone. So second thing, we do have, a, you know, we're still, we've been working on having a, church trip to see the Red Sox, we're getting hung up on the issue of transportation. So if you have any good ideas about transportation, if you would let Susan Amabile know, that would be great. And if not, we may not be able to end up doing this, and so we'll have to make this final decision pretty soon. But if, if we don't get some good thoughts on transportation, then we won't be able to do that, I say with some sadness. Uh, last thing uh, for me, we do have vestry this week, so if you've got any things that are of concern to you, like the vestry to consider, please just let a member of the vestry know. Anything else we need to say before we begin? Oh, Linda? Um, just prayers for you and your family as you travel. Thank you very much. I'm an anxious traveler, so I need a, need a little uh, prayers just for my spirit, if nothing else. So. All right, our service will begin. Oh, sorry, Joe? Yes, don't forget our dinner on May 1st. We'll yeah. It will be available next week. Yeah, so let me just emphasize this. So, yeah, May 1, we'll have a, a community supper, and in my emails, I have managed to get this right, but I have botched it on the bulletin. It's, it's barbecue chicken. So barbecue chicken is what uh, we'll be serving on May 1. So, up oh, Bob. Great. No, I thank you for that. So we don't, we're not selling tickets, but if you want to reserve a spot, then you can just talk to Bob after the service. So other things? Our service will begin in just a moment. Please turn in your dark blue hymnals to number 206, Dark Blue Hymnals 206. We'll sing one, three, four, and six. I'll remind you in the middle of it. Okay. <clears throat> Start with one. <clears throat> Oh. 
Our service this morning continues perhaps on the screen, yes, on the screen, and also on page 355 in the Red Book of Common Prayer, page 355. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. And let us pray together, the Collect for Purity, the bottom of 355. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue now with the praise song. Please turn in your bright blue St. David's song books to number 75, bright blue 75. be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together the contemporary version of the collect on the front of the insert. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The first reading is from Acts. Chapter 2, verse 14, 22 through 32. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know. This man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed 
by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, and he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke to the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses. Uh, so the psalm we'll be reading today is Psalm 16 um, from the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, please uh, join me uh, responsibly by half verse. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all other. All my delight is upon the godly, that are in the land. Upon those who are noble among the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. Their libations of blood I will not offer. Nor take the names of their gods upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. Indeed, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not fall. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave. Nor let your Holy One see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The second reading is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy has given us a new birth into a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The Word of God. Thanks be to God. The sequence hymn is in your dark blue hymnals, number 209, 209 verses 1 and 2. Oh 
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. When it was evening of the day of the resurrection, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came in and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails in my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> so every year on the, the first Sunday after Easter, or what we really would call the second Sunday of Easter, we get this story, the story of Doubting Thomas. And I just want to say, I have to say this every year really, that we don't necessarily give Thomas full credit. So Thomas was an apostle, he followed Christ, he was as best we can tell, brave and faithful. And he has this doubt, that's our story, more on that momentarily. And then at least as we go by tradition, Thomas did you know, go out and to help evangelize the world and, and ultimately died for his faith. So when we call Thomas Doubting Thomas, it's worth just remembering that doubting part is only a, a small part of the deal. But it is the part of the deal that, that is with us today. And so we can sit with what does it mean for Thomas to doubt? And how do we grapple with doubt ourselves? And so here's a first thing that is also important to me to say, uh, really every year. Although in church we think of doubt as bad, there are contexts in which doubt is really important. Doubt is another name in some respects for the process of discernment. So here's an example that I suspect we've all experienced in one way or another, particularly personal for us right now. Yesterday, my wife went up to visit her father, and when she showed up, her father was in the middle of being scammed. He was all set to go mail some cash off to somebody. This was based on somebody who had called him and had told him a lie. Well, Carrie got there. She said, this story doesn't sound right. She doubted, looked into it. It was, in fact, a lie. All ends well. Uh, <clears throat> but this is one of those places where doubt was really important. My guess is everybody in here has been approached in a scam kind of way before. Some people in here probably have received messages that claim to come from me, text or emails asking for money. For the record, I will never text or email you and ask you to send me cash. That's just not gonna happen. I've received those messages too. 
including I've received those from other priests in the diocese. I received it, I mean, not from other priests in the diocese, from our bishop. And so when we receive these kinds of messages, we need to doubt. That's a survival skill. You can think about this more generally in terms of anything you read on the internet. Probably most of you know this. This was a shocking thing for me to read about recently. There are such a thing as troll factories. Apparently what that is is banks of computers that have as their sole job to, to create, make up, and spew into the internet falsehoods. And so if you receive a message from a friend, sends it to you in good faith, and it's a, a message telling some outrageous, I mean an outraging story about a public figure, especially a politician, especially a politician you may not be inclined to like, there's a reasonable chance that, that story is a lie, that its ultimate source is one of these banks of computers in Russia or China or some other country, and that its sole purpose is to make us distrust and dislike each other. And so, when we read in the internet, we just need to exercise that discernment. We need to doubt and confirm and go from there. You can say the same thing in religious context. Of course, a lot of people make some pretty crazy claims in the name of God. And religious leaders have too often proven untrustworthy. And so, so we need always, I say again, to discern, which is to say when we hear things that don't sound quite right, to doubt, to explore, hopefully to get to the truth. Now I've always thought of Thomas as that kind of guy. I've always thought of Thomas as a hard-headed realist who says, if you want to make a claim to me, I'm going to need to see the evidence. You claim resurrection, I want to see him. I want to see him and I want to touch him. Because otherwise I can't really believe this. And that may be what Thomas was, that may be the form Thomas's doubt took. But a few weeks ago I was talking to Bishop Scroot about, about this story. And he said he thinks that that might not be actually what was going through Thomas's head and Thomas's heart that morning. He noted there are different ways to doubt. So there's the head doubt. You've said something, and now I have to intellectually, rationally decide whether I believe this to be true. But there's also heart doubt. It's a different kind of doubt. Heart doubt is about the things of the heart, about emotions, about relationships. It's not, not so much do I think this claim is true, but rather, can I trust this person? Does she really love me? Or is it all a show? Will he really have my back if I need him? Or will he go away? Will she honor her commitments to me? Or not? That's the heart doubt. And of course, that kind of doubt can be very painful. And it is at least possible, in fact, Bishop Scruton persuaded me, I think probable that that's really more the doubt that Thomas was grappling with in our story. So here's the context, just as a reminder. The uh, disciples are gathered in the upper room, and they're terrified. They think that what happened to Jesus, that is to say crucifixion, may happen to them too. It's a reasonable fear. They were grieving the loss of the horrible loss of this man that they love. They're struggling with disappointment and hope, I mean, hopelessness and pain. That's what they're dealing with. And Thomas leaves. And he's right with them. And when he comes back, they are different. Because this is what has happened to them in the meantime. Jesus shows up. And Jesus shows them that he has taken the worst the Roman Empire can throw at him, and he has overcome. He has defeated death itself. And then Jesus blesses them with peace. And Jesus breathes on them and gives them the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says to them, you have a new authority. I give you the authority to pronounce the forgiveness of sins in my name and in God's name. Now think about that, what that would do to you. That is a transforming encounter. So Thomas shows back up, and the disciples are not like they were when he left. They're not terrified. They are brave. 
They're not hopeless, they have hope. They're still no doubt in pain, but their pain is in the process of being healed. They are filled with courage and conviction and peace and confidence and joy. And Thomas missed it. And there Thomas is and he sees they have been transformed and I, Thomas, have not been transformed and I'm still living in that world of pain and fear and loss. And now it's even worse because now I'm alone in that world because the people who are in that world with me have been blessed by God. And so what Bishop Scruton suggests, what I have come to believe, is that when Thomas says, I won't believe, he doesn't mean I refuse to believe. He means, I can't believe this has happened. And he speaks with longing and grief. I want that too. Jesus came to you, and he didn't come to me. And now what am I going to do with that? Heart doubt. And so we can say more about Thomas' story in a minute, but we pause to note that, that Thomas is our guy. Thomas is the most modern of the apostles. We live in the age of doubt, and that's good doubt, but bad doubt too. And, and we struggle with that sometimes, as Thomas does. And sometimes we may see other people blessed, and we're not blessed in the same way. And we struggle with that. Or sometimes we see the grimness of our world, and we think, I don't know if God's kingdom really is on the way. Or maybe it is on the way, but maybe I don't get to be a part of it. These are the kinds of fears I think Thomas was wrestling with. These are the kind of fears that many of us will wrestle with. And so here's the good news. Thomas is our guy in this story, and Jesus shows up for him. And Jesus comes and gives him what he needs so that he can believe and he can trust. He can see that resurrection is real, and God's victory is real. And this is, in fact, God's world. And Thomas is a beloved part of God's world and of God's people. And here's the good news for us. Jesus is here, right this minute. And Jesus is saying to us, resurrection is real. And God's kingdom is on the way. And in some ways, God's kingdom is already even here in some at least possible glimpse kind of way. And we're part of it. Because God loves us. That's good news. And then we, sometimes we struggle with that. So here's one other thing that, uh, that Bishop Scruton and I talk about in this conversation that I found so helpful about this passage. So, so Christ comes to us with this message of good news, but it is sometimes hard to take in. So he suggested what you may have heard of before, a breath prayer. So he said, when you're struggling, when you're having the doubts, the heart doubts, the head doubts, whatever, whatever kind of struggle you have, to sit down and to breathe in. As you breathe in, say to yourself softly, Jesus. And as you breathe out, imagine yourself letting go of your troubles. And in Jesus, and out, letting go of your fears. And in Jesus, and out, letting go of your struggles. And if you do that for a little while, the odds are pretty good that you will experience a little bit of peace that you were not experiencing before. And then you can keep going. So if you begin to feel some of that divine peace, you can begin to say, all right, now I want to continue to breathe in Jesus and breathe out Christ and in Jesus and out Christ and in Jesus and out Christ. And that's because ultimately Christ is all in all and Christ is our breath and Christ is our life. And if we do that, if we picture ourselves like the apostles on that day with Jesus there breathing on us, giving us the Holy Spirit, then we can have this moment, this encounter with the resurrected Lord, and we can be transformed, not quite so quickly as they were, but over time, and then we can be people of resurrection, people of spirit, who shares that confidence and that peace and that hope with our world. And so this is my prayer for us, that, that we can have our own encounters with Christ, and that we can take in that peace and we can share it with love. And I say that in Christ's name. Amen.
And now please stand as you are able, and we will affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We normally do the Nicene Creed, but the Apostles' Creed, oops, no, we'll go ahead and do the Nicene Creed. So it's right there on the screen. So I do know the words of the Nicene Creed, but if we start, it's going to go out of my head. But not now. It's on page 358 in addition to the screen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We continue now with the prayers of the people. Prayers of the people today are Form 6 in the Book of Common Prayer, page 392. Please uh, pray with me responsibly. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. We pray especially for those on our parish cycle of prayer. Grounds and Gardens crew, the Criswicks, Tyler La Camera, the La Chapelles, and Marilyn Lake. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. We pray especially for those on our world cycle of prayer, Central African Republic. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. We pray especially for those on our diocesan cycle of prayer. St. Helena's, Lennox, Creation Care, Mampong Babies Home, Ghana, the Episcopal Media Services, and the Archives of the Episcopal Church. We also pray for the Anglican Church of Tanzania from the Anglican cycle of prayer. For all bishops and ministers. For all who serve God in the church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, we pray especially for those on our prayer list. Jane and Mark, 
that God's will be done. The Rendrick, Liberty, and Cassio families for comfort in their grief. Jean, Diane, and the Hansons for recovery and strength. Helene, Alicia, and Heather for guidance and strength. Jude for successful treatment. Jennifer for relief from pain. Katie, Nina, Kim, Astacio, and Dick for successful cancer treatments. Helene and Norm for recovery from procedures. Ken for healing in his eye. The Khan family, the two Lewis families, the Ukrainian people, and all victims of violence. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We thank you especially for Virginia Ventilect, Linda Seabury, and our hardworking choir. We also thank you for the flowers adorning our altar, which are given in loving memory of Aaron Clapp from Valerie and Roger Clapp and the sanctuary candle, which is given to the glory of God. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. Accept and fulfill our petitions, we pray, not as we ask in our ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Please stand as you're able for the peace.
we turn, there we go, before we turn to the great Thanksgiving, we have a handful of prayers to do. So one is we're dedicating today a, a cross that is here on the altar, which we'll leave on the altar as a part of our, um, as a part of our Eucharist. We also are dedicating a prayer shawl, which was made, this made by Dina, and it's got a very spiffy design. It's got a cross on it, so um, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to show it to you because I'd have to fold it back. But, <laughs> but. So let us say a prayer of dedication. Gracious God, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you especially for the prayer shawl. We thank you for the skill with which it is, the skill and love and prayerfulness with which it was made. With it may be a sign to the person to whom it goes of your love and care and of our love and care. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We've also got a lot of birthday praying to do, at least possibly. We didn't do any birthday prayers last week or the week before, and we may not do it. I don't know what you're thinking next week. We may or may not do it next week. So if you've got a birthday prayer in the last couple of weeks, the next couple of weeks, now's the time. Gretchen? <laughs> so. Oh, we're going to do an anniversary in one second, and we've got the same sort of several weeks to go with the anniversaries. But you got Jim, got a birthday for Jim and Renee, also my father and my sister-in-law, and, uh, and Robert. So any other birthdays? And Kim and Glenn? I say we're loaded with birthdays. <laughs> so. And sorry? Oh, so not Kim herself, but her son-in-law. All right, so let us say the birthday prayer, which may be on the screen, and which is on page 830 in the Book of Common Prayer. That's prayer number 51, page 830. And let us pray. Watch over thy children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts may thy peace, which passeth understanding, abide all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We've got at least one anniversary. So that's Gretchen and Jerry. Any other anniversaries? So let's pray the anniversary prayer, which again may be on the screen. And then the prayer book is on page 431 towards the top. So let us pray. O oh God. You have so consecrated the covenant of marriage that in it is represented the spiritual unity between Christ and his church. Send, therefore, your blessing upon these, your servants, that they may so love, honor, and cherish each other in faithfulness and patience, in wisdom and true godliness, that their home may be a haven of blessing and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we turn now to the great Thanksgiving Eucharistic Prayer A. In the very beginning may be on the screen, but you may also want to turn to page 361 in the Red Book of Common Prayer. Again, that's page 361 in the Red Book of Common Prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death. And by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Oh, 
gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself, in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Now please stand as you're able and let us pray together the post-communion prayer that may be on the screen. Yes, it's on the screen and also on page 366 in the Book of Common Prayer. And let us pray together. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Please turn in your dark blue hymnals to number 208. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. 208.
joy. 